Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. We're very pleased to have with us Jefferson Hawkins. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Jeff. Good to be here. Now, Jeff, for uh, new Scientology watchers who don't know your background, could you give us uh, briefly what you did as a church executive? Well, yeah, I was uh, I was in the church for over 35 years, and a lot of that time, uh, most of that time, I spent either in publications or in marketing. And uh, last 15 years, I was at the international base in San Jacinto, California, and I was a marketing executive there. Um, and prior to that, in Los Angeles, I ran the Dianetics campaign in the 1980s uh, that got the book on the New York Times. New York Times bestseller list. So you know what you're doing when it comes to books and Scientology. Now, Jeff, when you left the church publicly in 2004, you began to blog on the internet. And I, I remember you got a lot of attention because you were ahead of the pack, clearly ahead of the pack, writing about what Scientology looks like at the highest levels on the inside. And I remember reading your blog, Counterfeit Dreams, which then turned into a book. That's right. What we want to talk about today, your new book entitled Closing Minds, How Scientology's Ethics Technology is Used to Control Their Members. Yeah. This began much in the same way as Counterfeit Dreams as a series of blog posts. That's right. It was on Tony Ortega's uh, underground bunker. Yeah. And what you wrote about in those series of posts, you discussed the topic of Scientology ethics. Now that word out here in the non-Scientology world means something different than it does in the Church of Scientology. Jeff, what does ethics mean in the Church of Scientology? As I went through and wrote these articles, I actually was, uh, I based it on the book Introduction to Scientology Ethics. And as I went through and analyzed each chapter of that book, uh, I came to have quite a different view of what ethics means in Scientology. And really, um, it means doing what you're told or doing what will benefit the church. And if a Scientologist um, sort of uh, tries to color outside the lines or, or, or step over the boundaries or begins to doubt uh, what they're doing in Scientology or questions church, church management, anything like that, they're sent to ethics. So you, you, you rapidly get the idea of what they're doing here. They're really corralling in people and trying to get them to toe the line and not to rebel, not to question, not to doubt because if they do, they will run into ethics. So in terms of Scientology, they have a term in ethics. A uh, person is in ethics if they are doing what the church wants them to do, forwarding the church's purposes, uh, contributing money, taking their courses and all that. If, if a person is doing those things, they're considered to be in ethics. And if they are not doing what they're told, uh, if they are questioning management or questioning decisions that are being made, or if they're doubting Scientology, then they're considered to be out ethics. So that's really the purpose of it. Well, it's interesting. We note that uh, the book you mentioned, Introduction to Scientology Ethics, was written by founder L. Ron Hubbard, published in 1968. By this point, L. Ron Hubbard needed a high level of disciplined followers but even beyond that, he needed a group of indoctrinated followers. Per the title of your book, How They Control Their Members, what is the first point of Scientology ethics? Is it, is it really thought stopping? Would that be fair? Normally, the, the first thing that happens when a person comes into Scientology, one of the first course, courses they take has to do with, uh, and I'm not sure what they call it now, but it's the causes of suppression and all about suppressive people. And that's, that's a very, very basic course. And it's one of the first ones that a person takes um, after they have maybe taken an introductory course. Uh, and the idea is they really want to get across to them this idea that there are suppressive people and anyone criticizing the church is a suppressive person and you don't want to associate with those people. And this starts to sort of set up the bubble. Yeah, one of the first things, uh, you know, that a new person r runs across is if their friends or family start to criticize Scientology is just to kind of, uh, if they don't disconnect right away, they kind of shut them out or shut them up and tell them don't, don't talk about that. So that starts to, to get this whole idea of ethics into play. I'm glad you said that because milieu control, the idea of uh controlling a person's personal relationships, that would be the earlier and first step is to say you're a Scientologist, you're a member of this group, 
and you can't have friends or family who are critical of you. That's right. And the course nowadays is called PTSSP course, mm -hmm. how to confront and shatter suppression. Look at the power Scientology assumes early on. They wanna control your relationships. Absolutely. Now, after controlling your relationships, what's the next gradient or level of controlling a person? It's hard to say. They, they, they kind of get grouped in. It depends on whether they're going on staff or Sea Org or if they're just a public Scientologist. If they're a public Scientologist, they'll run into it probably in the course room. If they start to question things, the first thing they'll do, of course, is they'll say, well, you have a misunderstood word or, or this or that. But if the person has too many mis uh, disagreements, they'll end up with the ethics officer. And this is probably one of the early times when they'll uh, start to encounter ethics is if they question things, if they ask too many questions, if they are uh, asking questions about Hubbard, if they're sort of doubting what the materials say, and if the word clearing methods don't get them into line, they will end up with the ethics officer. So uh, so the, the, the public Scientologist pretty rapidly gets the idea that they don't make waves. You know, they don't make waves, they don't question what they're being told. Jeff, in Scientology, there's a term called an overt, O-V-E-R-T, an overt. Mm -hmm. An overt is a crime or a sin or a transgression. But the way the Church of Scientology does it, and help me out here, when you think anything contrary to Scientology or ask too many questions, do these then become overts? Well, yeah, in, in terms of the Scientology system, yes. Any doubt, uh, any doubt is considered to be an, an overt or a withhold, you know, any, anything like that. And they, so that they can rapidly uh, get brought into line. But the whole subject of overts brings up uh, confession, which I think people get exposed to quite early in Scientology. Uh, you know, because they get asked before every session, do you have any overts, do you have any withholds? And this starts to get in uh, control uh, of their mind at a very basic level. Now, this is fundamental to the Church of Scientology, the confession of your overts, transgressions, withholds. This slowly begins to give the church power over you. They've cut off your friends and now you're confessing to them the thoughts you have. What is a typical example of a doubt a new Scientologist might have that has to be handled in ethics? Normally, a, a, a new person will, when they first get into Scientology, they'll still be connected to their family, to their friends, and they'll still be, uh, they'll still have access to the internet. And they haven't been taught yet not to read uh, stuff that's critical of Scientology on the internet. So probably the first thing happens is, you know, they go home and they talk to their uh, family or their friends and they say, uh, why you, you're involved in that crazy cult of Scientology and haven't you read this and haven't you seen this? They, they run up against that confusion pretty quickly. And so if they go into the org and they say, well, I heard this and I heard this and I heard this, bang then they'll get into the uh, to the ethics officer and, and, and be raped over the coals. And, and that's when you start to get into, uh, okay, well, what, what, are, what are your crimes? What are, what are you, why, what have you done that you are so critical of the church and so forth? Now, this goes to uh, L. Ron Hubbard's assertion, his, uh, which is axiomatic in the church, that only criminals have uh, questions or doubts about the church of Scientology. Yeah, exactly. An ethics handling is where you, as a Scientologist, would go to the ethics officer, and you would be, would you be checked on the e-meter? Is it always done on the e-meter? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, yeah, sometimes it would just be, uh, uh, they would just handle them, uh, hand them some materials, and say, well, this is this is what we say about this. Um, you know, uh, Marty Rathbun is this and that, and Mike Render is this and that, and, and they will they will try to you know discredit whatever sources the person's been reading. But yeah, if they persist, uh, they're going to get put on a meter and ask what their what their overts are. And what's interesting about this, uh, a security check in the Church of Scientology costs money. It is not free. If you remember the Sea Organization or staff, it goes on your bill. Mm -hmm. If you if you leave later, you're charged a freeloader debt. If you're a public, you're charged for sec checking. Right. Charged for ethics. My wife Karen has told me, and so many others have told me, that many publics become fearful of expressing any doubts or saying anything because of the amount of money it will cost them. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. 
so you have a financial disincentive, a scourge to not express anything. One thing Hubbard really emphasized is the group. A Scientologist, he or she wants to be a member of the group. And you must be a member of the Church of Scientology in good standing. What does it mean to be in good standing with the Church of Scientology or a part of the group? This is where we get into condition because there is a um, condition of liability. Anybody who's been in the church gets familiar with these things. And these, there are, these are supposedly uh, natural states that Hubbard uh, discovered and uh, these kind of rote formulas to get out of this, uh, whatever the state was. And as you supposedly go down these levels, you get to something called liability, where the person becomes a liability to the group. At that point, they are no longer considered to be a member of the group, and they have to go through steps, which includes uh, making up the damage and uh, petitioning all the members of the group to allow to be rejoined. Well, this, this is um, uh, what Steve Hassan calls dispensing of existence, where your very existence in the group can be, can be granted or withheld. And the same with disconnection, the same with being declared PTS. A person who's declared PTS can't take services anymore. So they've been excluded from the group. So they, there are these various mechanisms that uh, communicate to the person, you are no longer in this group. You no longer have any existence in the group. And then the person has to then take steps and petition and do all of these things to be granted uh, approval to get back into the group. And that's a very powerful tool. I mean, particularly if you're a believing Scientologist and you think this is the only way to spiritual freedom and then you're told no no you're not allowed to do that you're not a member of this group you're not allowed to to, to do this uh this journey up the bridge uh then people will go no i have to do this i have to, I have, to I have to handle this and then they'll go through those steps and that's a that's a strong disincentive to do anything like that in the future or step outside the line jeff this raises a great question how are ethics conditions related to statistics which are the backbone of the church of scientology yeah this this is something that's very odd uh, and when i started to to pick this apart uh in, in my book and analyze it it, it really is odd um, if you think that a person's ethics or a person's ethical uh, nature is determined by production statistics. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You would think that a person's ethics would be defined by their decisions, their choices, how they treat other people, um, you know, their business dealings, whether they're honest, whether they can be depended on. You know, you would think that those are the sorts of things that would um, uh, determine a person's ethical standing. Not so in the church. In the church, it's very, very plain. The only thing that determines your ethical standing is your production statistics. In other words, what are you doing for the church? What are you producing for the church? For a staff member, it's whatever they're doing on their post. Uh, for a public, it can be how many people they're bringing in, how many student points they get, how many, um, how much uh, they contribute, how much money they send in, all of those things determine whether the church considers them upstat or downstat. Uh, and it's, it's really not the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. When you boil it down to its essence, it's, the, it's whatever benefits the church. And what benefits the church is the statistics. Jeff, it seems to me that this is, this is the crux of the matter. Rather than a person being judged by their, their character, their behavior, they're strictly judged by what they're producing for the church. Yes. Because the church is denominated in money, production, you know, what have you done for us lately? It seems that you could be in a continual state of crisis, doubt, despair, fear, depending on your ethics condition. Mm -hmm. And so you're driven to produce more for the church. And so the, the matter of character morals, value, true ethics go out the window because you have to produce. Well, this is much more typical of someone working, you know, in a, a corporation, you know, a job. I have to keep my job safety. But in this case, that same sort of job stress becomes linked to your spiritual eternity. Yes. 
I mean, didn't Jeff, when you were on post, you had enormous responsibilities in the church. Enormous. I don't think people really appreciate how much pressure you were under <laughs> and, and your colleagues at that level. Can you give our, our listeners an example of when you were given a really harsh ethics condition and what you did to get out of it? Well, yeah, as a staff member, particularly as a Sea Org member, you're dealing with these conditions all the time, every day, every week. You're looking at your statistics and making sure they're up. But of course, you know, you can only produce so much. So eventually uh, things will go down. And the church says, oh, no, no, things, things never go down. They always have to go up. And, and they say, well, you, you know, you could have made it go up and you didn't make it go up. And therefore, you're you're down. That's one way you get assigned a, a, a lower condition is your statistics go down and then you'll be in a condition of danger or non-existence. And if it continues, uh, then your senior will probably drop you lower and lower and lower. And I'll tell you, the last four years probably that I was at the end base, um, I, I was in lower conditions constantly and I think and pretty much everybody else at the base was too. Very rarely was anybody out of lower conditions. It just became a constant, constant uh, drag. And I think a lot of people just gave up uh, and just said, well, that's the way it is. We're just going to be in lower conditions forever. Uh, it, it got to be quite a scene. But but yeah, you know, so so conditions were part of daily life. And if you do, if you get into a condition of liability, you have to, you know, uh, do an amends project, make up the damage, and then you have to take a petition around to everyone on the base. And that was at one time it was a thousand people. It's down to about 300 now. But imagine and you couldn't do it during work time. You had to do it during during lunchtime, which was usually half an hour. So you had to eat fast and then get as many people to sign it as you as you could. And it could take weeks and weeks to get all of your signatures. And then finally, you get all your signatures, you present it, you get upgraded, and then the next week something goes wrong and you're back in liability. And it just became a complete drag, you know. Yeah, and what's interesting here is, for listeners who may not know, Scientology is managed by statistics, which is nothing new. Management by statistics goes back. You can read about it in the Old Testament. Jewish scripture where, you know, uh, kings counted the amount of cattle and everything else they had. So this is nothing new, but the, what the church does every Thursday at 2 p.m., people have to turn in their statistics for the previous week's performance. And then, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but then you're assigned your ethics condition based on your prior week's performance? Correct. And, and that's tied to the myth that statistics will infinitely expand. Right. That is, Scientology cannot recognize that there's a finite product or a finite market for its goods and services. Therefore, you must infinitely expand. Exactly. Now, Jeff, you worked on Dianetics, uh, the Modern Science of Mental Health, the book that, that you know, began uh, Scientology or Dianetics. You worked in the 80s on a campaign that made that a number one bestseller. That's right. Yeah. So as the book was selling more and more in bookstores, you're ethics conditions went up into what power affluence yeah yeah exactly so is life good in the church are you only as good as your most current ethics condition <laughs> you're only as good as your last week's statistics and we got the, we we took the sales from uh from nothing basically uh to about thirty thousand copies a week um so it, it, which was quite and, and this was not people going out and buying the, the, the books, Scientologists going out and buying the books. This was actually sales being generated by the advertising. And, you know, so that was a huge achievement. But God help me if the stats went down to 25,000 a week or 20,000 a week, uh, I was in trouble, despite the fact that the statistics were higher than they had ever been in the history of the church. Yeah. Well, now this reminds me of the three decades I spent in corporate life as a corporate salesperson. This is what I would call quota. Mm -hmm. I had a quota and I was as only good to the corporation as my previous month's quota. Exactly. And then at the beginning, even if I had a staggering year and I had some great years, at the new year, 
the year would roll over and then I was uh, a nobody. Mm. What it sounds like to me is Scientology fundamentally conflates or equates ethics with a quota. Exactly. And, and this would exert a powerful control over a person if they believe their quota or production was tied to their spiritual future. Mm -hmm. Now, at a certain point when the sales of Dianetics went down, was there a, what they call a stack crash? And, and what happened to you? Uh, well, eventually, um, I mean, as long as I had control of the unit, we, we were doing fine. And it was kind of, uh, I was sort of an entrepreneur within the church at that point. And I had rigged it so that I didn't really have a senior, which is hard to do, but not impossible in the church. I had set it up as an independent unit running this campaign. And I was ostensibly under Commodore's Mission or Org International, but I was really working with uh, Author Services and some people over there who were giving me air cover, so CMON couldn't touch me. And uh, I kind of had this autonomous little thing going on and just had the sales going up and up and up and up and up. Well, that came to an end when the whole unit was moved to the, uh, to the end base in San Jacinto, and I got under David Miscavige's thumb, and he began to dismantle my unit piece by piece, and then the stats crashed out after that, and I became, I became a nobody. All right, Jeff, what I wanted to say, one of the things Tony Ortega covered with you was the ethics of political power, Scientology's worship of ruthlessness. Mm -hmm. So your stats go down, the Church of Scientology is ruthless, your unit's dismantled as a result. Exactly. And you, once you lose your air cover, were you sent to the RPF? No, no. I, I just became part of the marketing uh, machine, which was uh, totally under the control of David Miscavige. And it became a unit that was just uh, totally for, uh, for his use in making money, repackaging the books and materials, repackaging the courses, prettying everything up, making it look new. Uh, and really the whole base became uh, kind of his tool to, to carry out his vision of Scientology, which is basically a glorification of himself and a money-making machine. Would you say at this time that the Church of Scientology had taken over your mind? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Any, anybody who is a believing Scientologist has had their, their mind taken over to one degree or another. Well, the reason I ask and this is not trivial to say that you're a believer. In, a cor in corporate life, you can just go along with the program. But, you know, you, you get off work at 6.30 at night, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have the rest of the evening. Yeah. But in the church, you don't get to be working in a job. You actually are in to help clear the planet. Mm -hmm. You're sh sharing the groups, the goal, and you're sincerely believing it, despite whatever is going on for you personally. Did you experience a lot of cognitive dissonance as a result of, of things falling apart around you and yet you, you were still very much committed to the church? Sure, yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was very committed as a Scientologist and I was a key player. But yeah, sure. And I think everybody does this, even at the end base. Um, uh, you have doubts about Miss Gavage and what he's doing. You have doubts about where the church is going. Uh, I was in many meetings where statistics were simply invented for the purposes of, of showing something at an, at an event. And n numbers and statistics were simply in, invented. And yeah, that, that disturbed me because people were just flat out lying about how big the church was. Well, now let's, let's dwell on this for a minute because this is a very much of concern to Scientologists uh, inside and out the church, the dishonest statistics. Yeah. Why does the church lie to its own public membership about the statistics? Well, they couldn't tell the truth because the truth is that the church is, is shrinking in terms of membership. And, you know, if they told the truth, that would be in theta, <laughs> according to the ethics system. So, no, and nobody wants to spread in theta because that would make them an SP. So the church itself is forced into the position of uh, putting on a, a happy face, even if it's a false face, because they don't dare tell the, the, the members the real situation. Now let's dig into this further, because this, I, this is, is so important. 
I asked you why the church can't tell the truth about its statistics, and you said that would be in theta. Exactly. Now, ethics has to do with honesty, integrity, you know, in, in, in the real world. Mm -hmm. And yet they're saying the telling of truth would be in theta. Mm -hmm. It would cause upset and disturbance to tell the truth. Yes. So the church has the church management has a withhold on its members about the real enact the real actual condition of the church. Exactly. While it's preaching that it's the most ethical group on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. And this goes to propaganda by redefinition of words. Why would it be okay for church management to lie to the membership? Well, on the other hand, it's an over for members to lie to management or have a withhold? Well, that gets into this whole idea of uh, what they call an acceptable truth or a short story. What does that term mean? Could you tell us about how Aaron Hubbard in his concept of the acceptable truth? Yeah, he said, um, and this was in some of his PR policy letters where he said, you know, you have to tell the truth in PR, but then he said, but, this is a big but, you don't have to tell everything you know, tell what some, tell them something that is acceptable to the other person. Uh, and so that gives you a lot of wiggle room. Okay, what is acceptable? Well, it, man, it, it, what is acceptable for int management to tell to the Scientology public is that everything's okay and the church is expanding. That's the only thing that's that's the only acceptable thing that they would be allowed to say. They're not allowed to say our statistics have been crashing since 1991 and the church is emptying out. Uh, they, they couldn't say that. So that's not ex an acceptable truth. So they have to tell an acceptable truth, which is also known as a lie. Founder L. Ron Harbord talked about telling an acceptable truth, or in other words, withholding actual data that might upset people. Yes. And within, within the context of the Church of Scientology controlling people, it seems to me the one main thing they want to control is Scientology PR. Oh yeah, absolutely. How central is PR to the entire Church of Scientology? Is that the centerpiece? It is, yeah, it, it, it is these days. I mean, the whole of the, uh, the whole of the int base was really involved in uh, PR and Scientology, creating these videos and these films that showed everything was wonderful. Uh, and they would send crews out to, to film these, you know, huge, supposedly huge orgs and missions. And I, I used to talk to these guys when they came back. They would have to set up the whole thing. Uh, in one case, they went out to, to, to film this supposedly huge mission and they found they couldn't even find the building. They had to. They had to rent <laughs> no building. They, they, there was no building. They had to. They had to rent a building and put furniture in it and bring all these people in to rush around and look busy and so forth. They created all this stuff. They create this impression that the the orgs are huge and expanding. And now they have the ideal orgs program, where they use uh, uh, public money uh, to buy these huge buildings and renovate them. And then they show these impressive ribbon cutting ceremonies um, with Miscavige front and center. And look how great it is, look how wonderful it is, look how much we're expanding. And nobody says anything about how these are all empty buildings afterwards. You know? Correct, and one, one essay that you did with Tony Ortega, you talked about how Scientology ethics creates a Truman Show. And not just at the level of the individual, but of the church itself. Mm -hmm. Under the context of Truman Show, that is a make-believe world, a bubble, as Mike Rinder calls it, yeah. you know, in, inside the bubble, is the net effect of ethics, on the one hand, it punishes people, but on the other hand, it's pushing people to, to create the Truman Show. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this gets back to what uh, uh, George Orwell talked about in 1984, about what is mind control. And people sometimes think, I think, that uh, uh, it's somebody else controlling your mind, like a hypnotist or something like that. But that's not really it. It's uh, true mind control is the person controlling their own mind according to the dictates of the group. Well, there, that gives rise to a question. Controlling their own mind, this is where the knowledge report comes in. Mm -hmm. The knowledge report if I understand it correctly, is the individual reporting on others. Yes. How 
crucial is the knowledge report to the entire Church of Scientology experience when you're inside? Well, that is what, um, that's their intelligence network inside any organization. Everybody is spying on everybody else. You're, you are being constantly watched by everybody else. Uh, if you're on staff, you you can't uh, you know idly stare at your computer screen or something like that because somebody's gonna somebody's going to uh, report you. You can't take an unauthorized break. Somebody's going to report you. If you uh, are frowning or or you know sad or crying, somebody will report you. Uh, so it's just, uh, it's the way they police things and it's the, w the same way the, the, the Stasi in East Germany uh, uh, operated, any of those, they operate with a, a network of citizen informants. But look at the ruthlessness of this. So you have auditing sessions in which you were supposed to confess your overt crimes, transgressions, withholds. Now secondarily, if you don't do that, your neighbor will do it for you. Mm -hmm through the knowledge report. That's right. How fearful were you of being knowledge reported when you were a senior executive? Oh, uh, constantly, constantly. You know that anything you do or say is gonna get reported. So you have to tread a really, really fine line and you have to know what, where, the, where the boundaries are, and what you can say and what you can't say. You were savvy, very smart to create an autonomous position for yourself. Mm -hmm. That tended to uh, insulate you from maybe otherwise being knowledge reported. Yeah. I think you were one of the few few people who probably had an autonomous unit in all of church history. Yeah, one of the few. I, I learned that that from Ken Delderfield, who was a master master of creating his own uh, his own independent unit. He did it more than once. You know, Jeff, I have to say, having been a corporate guy. When I talk to Sea Org executives, it very much uh, parallels my experience in corporate life. There's a lot of corporate politics. Oh yeah. And that and that's just an aside. And I think people who have been in uh, corporate positions, you know the politics, the the backstabbing that can happen, mm -hmm. and you also know the importance of trying to set up your own you know empire within a corporation where you have some power and protection. Exactly. And that's why I so appreciate you and the other senior Scientology executives who come on Surviving Scientology Radio because without you speaking, people would just not know what it's like on the inside of the church. And and that leads to my next question. You discuss with Tony Ortega high crimes and misdemeanors mm -hmm. and Scientology's bizarre criminal code. The ethics system is a bizarre criminal code on, on, in one sense. For example, if you make a mistake, are mistakes actually allowed in the church? Well, no, you, it, it, that, that becomes an error, which is the lowest level of, of uh, the, the crimes that they list. See, in corporate life, if you, if you make a mistake, you gotta clean it up and move on, right? But mm -hmm. stuff happens, yeah, you know? Yeah. But in the Church of Scientology, there are errors, misdemeanors, crimes, and high crimes. Mm -hmm. Could you, could you elaborate on these? Well, it's really interesting. If you look over the list of crimes and high crimes and you look at what are the things that they consider the worst transgressions, it's things like losing money for the church, uh, uh, crashing statistics, um, having a power push against a senior, criticizing a senior, um, you know, spreading rumors about a senior, uh, testifying uh, about the church to a court of law, reporting on, you know, outnesses in the church to the police. You could never do, that would be a crime. Everything, every crime that's listed there is something that harms the church or Hubbard or Miscavige. Those are the things that are punished and you will not find, uh, for instance, defrauding the public listed uh, in those crimes. You won't find uh, beating or abusing a staff member in those crimes. None of those things appear because that would be that would protect the public and it would protect the staff. And normally a business ethical code is designed to protect their customers and their employees. Scientology's quote unquote ethical code is completely to protect um, the Scientology system itself, the Church of Scientology and the highest executives. And that's that's its entire purpose. 
And you are so correct in the church, it's very self-serving. Mm-hmm. In fact, it becomes so self-serving that it becomes okay to lie and still be part of the most ethical group on the planet. Yeah, yeah. And i got to tell you, non-Scientologists cannot get their mind around this. It's only when you're in the bubble inside the church that it's okay to lie. Mm-hmm. And in fact, it's okay to do something for the greatest good. Exactly. Is, at the core of Scientology ethics, you're, you're, you're taught to make decisions based on the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. Mm-hmm. But as you just stated, it really has to protect the church, protect Miscavige. Yeah, yeah. You had an encounter with David Miscavige that was brutal. Several, yeah. What was the worst encounter you had with David Miscavige? Well, I've, I've described this many times, and it's, I've described it in my, in my uh, book, Counterfeit Dreams. But uh, I, I, at the time, I was, uh, uh, I was writing um, an infomercial for Scientology, and I had done two of those previously, and they had been very successful. And so I was writing this thing, and I was consulting with infomercial professionals, um, and going back and forth, and we finally got the script into, the, into shape where the professionals thought it, would, it was good and it would sell. This is non-Scientology professionals who do infomercials for a living. Uh, and then I went up to this meeting with David Miscavige. He had a chance to read it over, and he just, you know, started tearing it apart, mocking it, making fun of it. And when I tried to explain some of the thinking behind the decisions that I've made on, the, on writing this, uh, he wouldn't have it. He said, look, at, you see how he talks to me? You see how he talks to me? You see how he talks back at me? And you see how he looks at me? And, you know, all of this stuff as if I wasn't in the room. Um, and then without any warning, he, uh, he literally jumped up on the conference room table, launched himself across the table at me, knocked me into a, 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 a partition, uh, and then and was hit my face repeatedly, and then knocked me to the ground. My shirt was torn and everything else. And everybody, all the other execs, there was like 30 or 30 or 40 top Scientology execs in the room. They were all going, uh, get up, get up. You know, you don't want to make him wrong and so forth. <laughs> and uh, and of course, I was the one who ended up in security checking uh, to find out why I had provoked uh, David Miscavige and so forth. So I was the one who was penalized for it. Jeff, look at the, the reversal of of normal life in the church. He, David Miscavige has attacked you physically. He It's assault and battery. Mm-hmm. And, and you're the criminal. Exactly. <laughs> now, within David Miscavige's own mind, he was correct in doing what he did. And I suppose, that's what... I, 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 I don't know what he was ever thinking. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, the, 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 granted, he is irrational. But within the system of the church, you were punished and not him. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's that's the, is the exact opposite of what happens in non Scientology life. In fact, Anderson Cooper, on on CNN, asked uh, the Scientology officials present, "Why wasn't the person beaten? You know, given a chance to file charges?" Mm-hmm. Church attorney Monique Yingling said, "We chose to handle it internally." Yeah. Now, I found that breathtaking. <laughs> One, because it was honest, <laughs> which is not always characteristic of the church. But two, that's uh, the Church of Scientology brutality in a nutshell. We chose to handle it internally. Exactly, exactly. You must surely have felt devalued as a person to have been attacked and then put into sex checks after being beaten. Sure. What happens to your commitment as a Scientologist at that point? Is that when it begins to crack? That that was the beginning of a, a long process of, of leaving. That was in 2002, and it took me um, a couple more years of going through different experiences to finally decide to leave. But that was really the turning point where things started to go south. Now, Jeff, you talked have talked about uh, Committee of Evidence. Yes. With Tony. Now, did you ever have to go through a committee of evidence, and what is a committee of evidence? Oh, many times, many times, and I've described that in the in in the book. Um, 
it's basically a military tribunal. Uh, it's based on the system of military tribunals, but it removes any, all of the safeguards of that system. Uh, in essence, the, the head of the unit or the commanding officer of the unit is the convening authority. Uh, he decides who is going to be members. The person who is uh, on trial has no say and cannot object to the membership of, of the Committee of Evidence. Um, and they are called before this and so forth. And then the, the committee finds whatever they find and they submit it back to the convening authority who can approve or disapprove it. And if he disapproves it, it comes back to the committee until, until they do something that he is happy with. And he can even disband the committee if he doesn't like the job that they're doing. So it's a complete uh, system that serves the power structure. If you're a CERG member, a committee of evidence, can it, uh, you know, can it assign you to the RPF or how does one get sent to the RPF? Sure, committee of evidence. I mean, these days, um, you know, when I was, uh, the last few years I was there, somebody could be sent to the RPF because they disrespected David Miscavige or because he, you know, he, he said, you're going to the RPF and they would just go. There was no justice action. It was just RPF, RPF, RPF. Now, RPF means Rehabilitation Project Force. Yes. And Jeff, were you ever sent to the RPF? I have the, I have the shortest time in the RPF in history. I was there for one day. Really? <laughs> yeah, a, that is a record. Yeah, that's a funny story, but we, we don't need to get into it now. Yeah, we'll visit for another time. Well, your services were needed elsewhere. Exactly. And uh, the RPF is a convenient thing for, for them. It's... Uh, can you tell new listeners what the RPF is? Is it? It's a re-education camp, like the Chinese were doing. It's where the person gets re-educated into being a good little, uh, you know, rule-following uh, robot. And it can go as uh, it can go up to ten years. I've heard that. Yeah, more. I've heard that people are in there for years and years and years. Not supposed to be that way. Jeff, what would you say to people still in the church listening? Because I have a lot of listeners who are still in the church mm -hmm. about ethics. Well, I would tell them that their instincts about this whole system are correct. They know there's something wrong with it. They, they fear it. Uh, they dislike it. Uh, and they know that it's wrong. But they don't dare do anything about it because uh, then they'll lose their position in the church, they'll lose their eternity, quote unquote, they'll lose their friends and family. So they keep quiet about it. But what I would tell them is, no, your instincts are correct. It is a corrupt, corrupt, self-serving system that the church uses to control you. And I think as soon as you realize that, uh, then you start on the road out. Now the road out of Scientology can be very brutal Within the Scientology system of ethics, the SP declare or the suppressive person declare is used as a weapon against people for various reasons. Mm -hmm. If a person begins to think for themselves and get out of the mind control, the church declares them. Mm -hmm. So really what is an what is ultimately as you see it now, having been on both sides of an SP declare? Because you are a declared SP. Sure. How is the threat of an SP declarer used? And what does it really mean to be declared? It means, it means you're out of the church. It means you're not allowed to, to take any services. And it also means that anyone who is in the church, who might be your good friends or your family, has to disconnect from you and they are not, no longer allowed to talk to you. So it could be your parents, your children, anything like that. It's a, to a believing Scientologist, it's a death sentence, really. It, it's your life being taken from you. And it's the, so therefore it's the ultimate weapon within the ethics system, the threat of expulsion. Exactly. Of SP Declare. More and more people these days are experiencing their SP Declares as a form of liberation or a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. And not that it still doesn't cost them dearly, but, but it is, you know, they do leave the church. They, they no longer are in the system. Jeff, when a person leaves the Church of Scientology, they have to, over time, 
get their minds out of the whole system of ethics mm -hmm. into which they were indoctrinated. That can take many years. Yeah, absolutely. For you, how long would you say you were in for a long time? How long did it take you to begin to feel yourself? Well, I think um, I didn't. I didn't even write anything for about three years. I think it was um, because I hadn't sorted out my head enough to write anything coherent. Uh, but after after I'd been out for a couple of years, I started sorting out my thoughts about it to the point where I began writing my my uh, memoir of my time in Scientology. But before that, I couldn't write a thing. And then you know, it's a gradual process. It's, it's peeling the onion. You just have to take it layer by layer and uh, and keep searching and keep thinking and keep talking to people and. Uh, Eventually, I think all the layers peel off. Jeff, you know, we're, we're both writers. And you're an outstanding writer. Writing can be very therapeutic. I've often encouraged people who've left the church to start a blog to put their thoughts down in writing. And yet they say, oh, nobody will read it. I'm not a writer. Hmm. T talk briefly about the value of writing things just to have for posterity to record. How therapeutic do you see writing being and leaving the church? Well, it was very therapeutic for me. Uh, even if I had, even if nobody had read it, I would have been happy to just have gotten it down on paper. I mean, fortunately, people did want to read it. <clears throat> and I think people are interested in, uh, in people's Scientology stories, particularly other Scientologists that are exiting or thinking about leaving, I think all those stories are really, really valuable. They don't have to be long, but I think there's a value in uh, writing it down, getting it out there where other people can, can access it and read it. I agree completely. I think that writing it can be very healing, mm -hmm. and it's important to share uh, details with people. I've always subscribed to what I call the invisible audience theory. And that's meaning you never know who is reading you. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you an interesting story briefly. I had a chance to meet the two private investigators who followed Pat Broker for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Now, I met them very briefly before any settlement when they were suing the church. And I was introduced to them as Jay Swift. That's my pen name. I began writing at Xenu.net back in 2005. Yeah. One of them said, you're Jay Swift? When I was in OSA, I read everything of yours. <laughs> he said, I like what I read. And I was just, I mean, I was, it was a good acknowledgement, but I, I was amazed. And that's when it was really driven home to me that you never know who's reading your stuff. Oh, very true. Very there true. is an invisible audience of people. You'll never know who it could touch. And I think, uh, Jeff, people were so grateful when you began writing, you know, Counterfeit Dreams, the blog. And I was, uh, I was absorbed by the, the details, mm. the things you did, uh, even at your time in Bokeh Canyon. And people can relate to all that. So I, I, I likewise encourage people to write because it can be part of your recovery out of a cult. Sure, absolutely. And Jeff, we appreciate you coming uh, onto Surviving Scientology Radio today. We always love having you as a guest. Your book, Closing Minds, How Scientology's Ethics Technology is Used to Control Their Members, is available online. Where can people buy it? Uh, on Amazon uh, Kindle. Amazon Kindle. Well, I, Karen and I certainly look forward to reading it. And as always, Jeff, we uh, appreciate your insights into the church, and we appreciate what you're doing to help educate and inform the public about what the Church of Scientology really is. Right. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.